The space today is $2 trillion. I think it's going to $100 trillion. That's just the extrapolation of the of market cap or the log regression channel of the price of Bitcoin. You can kind of back it out in a number of different ways. And maybe I'm an idiot wrong by 50%. It goes to $50 trillion. By 2032, 2034, something like that. And so the job, therefore, is to ride that trend. It's not because one thing that people don't understand is it will not be a $50 trillion Bitcoin world. Bitcoin might be 10 trillion. Well, there's going to be 40 or 90 trillion of value created somewhere else. And that's what hedge funds can do. In a thought provoking conversation, Raul Pal and Tusha Jain dive deep into the future of cryptocurrency, envisioning a $100 trillion industry by 2032. They explore beyond the usual suspects like Bitcoin and Ethereum, highlighting the untapped potential of low float tokens and the transformative power of blockchain in reshaping economic design and value creation. Tusha Jain, interviewed by PAL, emphasizes blockchain's possibilities for coordination, token economic design, and value capture, focusing on productive assets such as DeFi and Solana. Raul Pal predicted that the cryptocurrency business would increase from $2 trillion to $100 trillion by 2032. He pointed out the importance of looking beyond Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana to capitalize on this boom, citing hedge funds' ability to uncover alpha and manage risk. Pal pointed out that hedge funds have cash at stake and must prioritize risk-adjusted returns. He also addressed the behavioral economics of token value and network effects, implying that they are still not fully understood. Raul Pal identified low float tokens as an opportunity, citing known supply and reduced pricing that provide asymmetric risk reward. He anticipates enormous growth with the potential for $50 trillion or more in value creation beyond Bitcoin. Watch clips from the interview for further insights into Raul Pal's conversation. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more content. Enjoy the video. I also built a business around this um, called Exponential Age Asset Management is because I think hedge funds offer the great opportunity to capture the alpha in markets. You see, the crypto markets are going to go from, I think, $2 trillion where they are today to something like $100 trillion by maybe 2032. That's an enormous rise, and we won't capture it all by just focusing on Bitcoin, Solana, and Ethereum. We need to be able to move further out the risk curve, but that's bloody hard. It's not something I can do. This is what hedge funds are really good at. They do this. They spend all of their time looking for alpha, looking for opportunities. So I find speaking to hedge funds super rewarding because these guys have capital on the line. They not only have their own personal capital, they also have investor capital. So their job is to focus on the best opportunities in a risk-adjusted return basis. I too was class of 2013 with Bitcoin. One of the things I saw in it immediately was the game changer in, in terms, of, terms of both capital formation and kind of aggregation of, of interest of people is the behavioral economic side of this thing. Because, you know, you bring people into a network and the token value goes up because of Metcalfe's law increases the value of the network. And that allows you to bootstrap businesses really fast. And I still think that hasn't been fully yet understood by people in what that means. Yes, we see some perverse incentives now, you know, airdrops or, or, you know, sort of ways of farming it. But I think the ICO thing was the start of something much bigger. I've also been thinking through this, this, um, these low flow tokens. And one thing that I think firstly is now the market discounts them. So therefore you get a, a good shot in the liquid markets to make a decision because the decision I think you've got to make is the supply is known. So that's off the table. You know, in typical markets, unknown supply, unknown demand, that's complicated. Known demand, not known supply, you can model something and the, and the reverse side. So I look at these and like, I know what the supply is going to be because we've now got the unlocks. The tokens have been discounted because low supply. And then what you know is, well, if demand does come, the beta of a low float is gigantic. And I think it's going to crush everybody's understanding of what low float means in this bull market, and they'll all be wrong. And they'll be wrong because limited float, but good demand, because some of these are really great projects, will create 
really asymmetric risk rewards. I don't think anybody understands this because they think future token unlocks always mean the price under pressure. Yeah, in a bear market, they'll probably go down more than others. But in a bull market phase with a very small float, I think this is very interesting. The space today is $2 trillion. I think it's going to $100 trillion. That's just the extrapolation of the of market cap or the log regression channel of the price of Bitcoin. You can kind of back it out in a number of different ways. And maybe I'm an idiot wrong by 50%. It goes to 50 trillion by 2032, 2034, something like that. And so the job, therefore, is to ride that trend. It's not because one thing that people don't understand is it will not be a $50 trillion Bitcoin world. Bitcoin might be 10 trillion. Well, there's going to be 40 or 90 trillion of value created somewhere else. And that's what hedge funds can do because that's a hard job. You need to be super focused to think where is the really big value accrual like you did with Solana. Classic example is you see something really early stage and the value accrual has been vast from that and it's not over. And that's what I think the bigger opportunity, if people zoom out, stop worrying about the cycles as much and just think, how do I capture that trend? Because I think that is the largest fastest accumulation of wealth in all human history if that plays out. Tushar Jain remarked that Ethereum's launch in 2016 was groundbreaking, demonstrating blockchain's ability to facilitate cooperation and product development. He pointed out that blockchain is a coordination technology that may enable individuals to collaborate and align incentives to build economically relevant items. Jain is looking for protocols that enable this, such as DeFi and stablecoins, which are not viable without blockchain. Tushar Jain also emphasized the significance of token economic design and value capture, stating that his team has conducted substantial research on these areas. He explored the distinctions between the venture and liquid crypto worlds, focusing on token lockups and float. He underlined the importance of productive assets, such as Solana and Helium, which produce goods, as opposed to financial assets like Bitcoin. Let's go back to the interview and watch more clips to gain insights from Tushar Jain. When I saw crypto, I got really excited. Uh, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2013 uh, and I bought a couple, literally just two. I wish I had bought more. Everyone wishes they had bought more uh, back then. But Bitcoin wasn't for me at the time because... It was all about hard money and Austrian economics and some of these things that, uh, you know, while I understand and appreciate are not what I identify with. What got me really excited was in 2016, I saw Ethereum and Ethereum showed me how you could use blockchain technology to coordinate people, to build products and do things that they couldn't otherwise have done. Our vision was that Crypto or blockchains at their heart are a coordination technology. They are meant to be used to help people coordinate together and align incentives in order to deliver commercially useful products. And that's always what we look for is uh, protocols where they're doing something that otherwise would not have been possible. So DeFi is an interesting example of that. Or DPIN is another really interesting example of that. These are creating useful products for the real world, stable coins, another useful product for the real world that would not be possible without the accounting ledger, the coordination technology that is a blockchain. So that was our fundamental thesis from the very beginning. And then we looked for different instantiations of that thesis where uh, we could go and apply it. And then we had a number of follow-on criteria for investments because uh, obviously, entry price really matters. Obviously, what does value capture look like really matters, right? Like we're venture capitalists, not venture philanthropists. So uh, we are looking for things that can earn a profit and make a, you know, make a return for us and our investors. Um, so we looked at a number of token economic designs. I think that was one of the areas where we really focused. Uh, a lot of people at the time, especially in the early days, were betting on founders they were betting on people because they're like, oh, you know, th this sounds really good. They're betting on ideas. And we did a lot of work on things like the token velocity problem and like how you should design a token and how you should not design a token. What tokens will capture value? What tokens won't capture value? Because the economics of protocols are very different than the economics of companies. There is a 
philosophical misalignment between what the venture crypto community thinks and what the liquid crypto community thinks. The venture crypto community thinks that long lockups signal incentive alignment and that this is a good thing for you to do because um, it shows that you're around for long term. You're not in it to make a quick buck. You're not going to flip the thing. But the liquid crypto markets think low float, high FTV projects are really hard to invest in because you don't have price discovery when you have a 3% float, right? Like that's the number, you might see a number on the screen, but that number is not actually what the asset is worth. You have a 3% float, you know? Um, and, and so you have this disconnect. Let's look at, you know, traditional markets. Gold is what percentage of total wealth, right? It's a, it's a small minority of total wealth. Actually, most global, most global wealth is in global equities and real estate and other real productive assets. Yes, we do need financial assets in order to make the economy function, but financial assets should always be a minority compared to actual productive assets. And to me, you know, Bitcoin is going to be enormously valuable, uh, is already enormously valuable. I think it's going to be far more valuable than it is today. But to me, that is a financial asset. Bitcoin is not a productive asset. You can't do stuff with it. It doesn't generate cash flows. It doesn't, it doesn't have a business model behind it. It's just an asset. Whereas when I look at something like a Solana or a Helium or you know, some of these other projects in which we're investors, these are productive assets. They are businesses that deliver a product that consumers are willing to pay for. Meanwhile, despite a 0.6% drop last month, Ethereum remains the leader in the crypto world in terms of development activity. It has reached 180,000 dev activity events, considerably above the second ranked project, BNB Chain, which has only 90,100 events. This high level of development activity frequently signifies technological growth and implies that Ethereum is actively being upgraded and expanded. Ethereum is among the most centralized cryptocurrencies, with 44% of its supply in 10 main wallets. This centralization might be regarded positively, as most major holders are staking platforms that enable investors to contribute to mainnet security while earning rewards. High staking activity lessens Ethereum supply pressure and can increase prices during periods of high demand. Furthermore, Ethereum exchange traded funds, ETFs, have returned to negative flows with outflows of $1.7 million. This indicates that investors are growing increasingly cautious and withdrawing funds. Furthermore, Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin may have reduced his Ethereum holdings from 325,000 to 240,000, worth around $592 million. Technically, Ethereum has fallen below a crucial trend line, implying that it may fall below the $2,000 to $2,300 price range. Ethereum has historically had substantial rallies following comparable dips. Resistance levels for Ethereum is between 2,817 and $3,542. A successful advance over these levels may result in further growth. As the futures markets open interest, OI declines, traders become more cautious. The OI has fallen by 5% in the last 24 hours to $10.39 billion. This demonstrates that traders are more cautious, particularly following the meltdown on August 5th. In conclusion, do you prefer investing in Bitcoin for long-term value or diversifying into other blockchains like Solana or Ethereum? Please drop your thoughts in the comments below, share this video, and hit your thumbs on the like button. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.